is you don't criticize your own side anymore. You just affirm the right, rightness of your side. And that leads to a great deal of conformity and, and it will end up being a very boring uh, culture. So I, I fear in the next, you know, however long it takes, I mean, everything changes. But I fear that, that we're, we're in a period of very timid, conformist uh, culture in the arts as well as intellectual life. Okay, we are started. We are underway. This is The Glenn Show. I'm Glenn Lowry. I teach at Brown University, and I'm senior fellow, John Paulson, senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute. The Manhattan Institute sponsors The Glenn Show. Every other week, John McWhorter and I get together. This is one on such occasion. Uh, John is at Columbia University, and he writes for The New York Times. Um, we are joined today, and we're honored to be joined today by Ian Baruma who is a renowned uh, writer, journalist, editor, um, an expert on things from uh, the Asian theater, but he writes also about European culture and politics, many, many books, an embarrassingly large number of excellent books from Ian Baruma. Uh, so we're very pleased to have him on the show uh, to talk about, um, among other things, um, his recent piece in Harper's Magazine, where he's a regular contributor, um, on uh, the spirit of wokeness, the Protestant ethic and the spirit of wokeness. You call it doing the work. Uh, and uh, that's a topic on which John McWhorter has uh, written. His book, Woke Racism, uh, makes the argument that there is a more than passing religious uh, characteristic to the uh, cultural politics of the left in America today. And uh, I'm interested in hearing what Ian has to say about that. So welcome to the show, Ian. Thank you. So what about the Protestant ethic and the spirit of wokeness? Do you want to just briefly tell the audience what you're after in that piece? Yes. Well, I mean, the main reason I wrote the piece, this is a roundabout answer to your question, um, is really because I think that what what is regarded as woke, and of course that's not very easy to describe what exactly is regarded as woke, but let's assume that we know more or less what we're talking about. Um, I think it's it's very necessary to have a, a liberal uh, critical view of it and not leave it up to the far right to use it as a political tool. And that was really the reason I, I wanted to analyze it um, uh, in various ways. And the um, Protestant, are you still with me? I am with you indeed. Yeah. Uh, and the Protestant uh, aspect of this, um, John has already written about uh, this, but I think that in a, in a secularizing society, people still often have a religious mentality and they, they look for different views to find uh, a moral stance that even if it's no longer based on the received truth of the Bible and that sort of thing, they find other ways to do this. And Protestant, Protestantism fits this bill better than, say, Catholicism because it has a tradition of public um, attestations to faith and apologies for having um, uh, veered from the true line and that kind of thing. And so I think it's a secular form of, um, well, uh, a Protestant, a kind of Protestant moral wave and moral fervor. Um, Ian had just characterized uh, the broad outlines of his uh, article in Harper's, his recent article in Harper's uh, on the Protestant ethic in the spirit of wokeness. Apology is an important part of that uh, scenario, is it not? Uh, you're asking me or John? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm asking you, Ian. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, it is a very important part, and and um, and this again uh, has everything to do with the Protestant tradition of um, testifying to one's faith uh, in public, and and also confessing one's sins in public, which of course Catholics don't have to do because they 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 have confession in church, and it's a much more private affair. Uh, and so again, um, Protestantism. Um, uh, fits this, um, aside from the fact that um, the United States has a long Protestant tradition. I mean, even people who are not Protestants 
um, uh, often um, have, have, have strong influences from Protestant culture. And I say this as, somebody, as, as a Dutchman uh, growing up in Holland, which has a very similar tradition, even though there are many Catholics living in the Netherlands and most people no longer go to church, uh, the Protestant culture um, has very deep roots. It's clear that a certain kind of person, and it's a very common kind of person, gets a sense of um, life's meaning and a sense of basic significance on this earth and even a sense of going through a pathway in adopting this kind of confessional slash punitive religious kind of behavior. And it's funny, there's a thought experiment that I often find myself doing. Would these people find this sort of thing so attractive if there had been no, for example, Protestantism before? Is it replacing it? Or is it just a natural human impulse in stratified societies where having a sense of yourself as just a family member and a contributor to a tiny community is more elusive, and so ennui is more likely to set in. And I'm not sure how important the answer to that question is, but I certainly have been massively struck by the parallels between religious behavior and the behavior of people, many of whom laugh at the very notion of religiousness and yet are acting exactly like the sorts of people they think of themselves as beyond. And I've noticed that um, with my book, Woke Racism, the main criticism has been, and I didn't expect this to be the main criticism. The main criticism has been my calling all of this a religion. People would prefer that I used ideology or cult or something like that. I think I've annoyed a lot of people by showing my openly admitted impatience with organized religion and with religious thought in general. That's a flaw of mine. I really, that kind of thought has created a lot of trouble for me in my life. And I think people could detect my attitude towards it in the book. But the parallel is too close to be ignored. And I prefer the term religion over ideology because I think that it's something more fervent than an ideology always is. It's not just a way of looking at the world. It's a, it's a sense of commitment as to what to do about that way of looking at the world. And to me, it, yeah, it reminds me of a certain kind of, of Christianity. And you can't help noticing that it's become so much stronger whenever fewer people are adherents of that religion or hear something. It's less common among people who are genuinely religious and deeply into Christianity. There are exceptions to this. Such, but then again, if I associate that kind of behavior with one particular Christian sect, it's Unitarians. And of course, these are you know, much more secular people than, say, Pentecostals, for example. It's not a surprise that it's them and not, say, Pentecostals who are most likely to adopt this kind of thing. So, yeah, it's a, it's a powerful parallel, and I will go to my grave. I don't intend to ever die, but if I do go to my grave, I will insist that this be called a religion, despite that many people don't like that about my, my, my ideology. I would agree with you, um, partly because most ideologies uh, seek their justification in having um, a set of ideas, a set of arguments that make logical sense, that, that are supposed to persuade, whereas uh, a religion is a question of faith. And um, so whether uh, immaculate conception in the Catholic Church uh, can be logically or scientifically explained in many ways is irrelevant. I mean, you believe in it or you don't. If you believe in it, then any, uh, any scientific argument or rational argument is not going to be persuasive. Because, and, and, so I, I, and I think a lot of what we're talking about uh, is a question of faith rather than um, uh, logically articulated arguments. As to the question whether it's specific to pro Protestantism, uh, I, I think probably not. I mean, one reason, of course, why religions have particular rituals, in, in this case, the ritual of, of confession and, and public apology, is to keep people in line. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a way for people who claim authority to keep the believers in line. You have to show in public that you're uh, one of the community, again, by apologizing. And in fact, there are parallels in the non-Protestant world. Um, I didn't go into that in my piece, but um, the way Confucianism works in East Asia is very similar. That even something as trivial as um, a small littering a public park 
if you're caught by the police, the first thing you have to do is write a self-confession. And the more sinister um, version, of course, of this is, is the uh, so-called um, re-education in Maoist uh, concentration camps, where um, you have to con continually confess until uh, your interrogators are convinced that you're, you've, you've joined uh, the community of faith once again. Now, that's very extreme, but that too um, rests on a much older tradition. And even though Confucianism can't really be compared to Christianity as, as a religion, as we understand it. But I think this human impulse is, is much more, goes way beyond uh, the Protestant world. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me just express my, I'm one of these people who never did like John's uh, evocation of religion in the context of uh, woke racism. Uh, I always thought it did a disservice to religion. I, I thought it didn't take religion seriously. I, I thought it was kind of an analogy where I could identify certain dimensions of the phenomenon wokeness that map onto dimensions of the phenomenon religion, but that the substantive role that religion has played in human culture over the millennia was not given a fair... Uh, representation. Uh, and it, it's a way of using your visceral dislike for religion and your visceral dislike for wokeness to buttress one another. Uh, but um, I guess I, I remain unconvinced. I remain unconvinced that because there are aspects of religious practice that are pr discernible in uh, the world of the woke, uh, that uh, we're not leaving out something important uh, when we when we just identify the one with the other. Glenn, well, I have a response to that actually that'll be useful here, and that is that um, I'm sure you'll agree that if I didn't say that it was a religion, if Ian weren't making this comparison, using the other terms wouldn't get any attention for one thing, but more importantly, it would undershoot the nature of things. I don't think if I may, Glenn. I don't think you believe that what's going on here is really a bunch of people who have an ideology. You know that there's more going on than an ideology. It's more. And I detect, and I've never reified this until right now in our discussions, punitive wokeness bothers you less than it bothers me. I am utterly revolted by it. I see it as the death of civilization as I know it. It makes me sick. You look upon it from more of a distance. Why? Well, gosh, I, I, I didn't know I did that. <laughs> you do. You're it not as lost... into it as me. That's all. Uh, I don't know how to respond to that, to be honest with you. I mean, uh, it does, you're right. Uh, it doesn't, you know, revolt me. It doesn't disgust me in the way that you will often give voice to no, uh, it 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 troubles me. Uh, punitive wokeness is what we're talking about. Punishing people for saying the wrong word, or for writing a tweet that seems off color, or for not affirming every jot and tittle of the catechism of contemporary cultural progressivism, of having some question about I don't know uh, gender affirming care for adolescents, or uh, I don't know. Uh, the anti-racism uh, mania of the Black Lives Matter types or the Ibram X Kendi's or whatever. I look at them, I see them for what they are, at least I think I see them for what they are. I think they are misguided, uh, wrongheaded to the extent that I do. And I, but I don't, I don't feel viscerally disgusted by them. You wouldn't write a book so, about it. You wouldn't write an article about it the way Ian has, for example. Yeah, uh, I don't know how to answer that. But your your response to my my complaint, my complaint was Christianity is two millennia of human culture uh, of one sort or another, people striving to work out for themselves the dilemma of what's the meaning of life, uh, what what happens after death, uh, what what is virtue, uh, 
what, what are we obligated to do? What, how, how do we relate to the traditions handed to us by our ancestors? There, there's something majestic about this mo- two millennia old tradition, something, something deep seated. And, and uh, I, I feel like the latter day effusions from uh, the, the woke cultural left are small in comparison to the stakes that are being engaged by, uh, by the Christian tradition. Uh, so, you know, I'm not a historian. I'm not a cultural uh, guy. I'm a, I'm a humble economist over here, you know, doing my numbers and whatnot. But it, it just seems to me that you're selling the great, the world religions, the great world religions and the impact that they've had on, uh, on human culture short by, by that equivalence. I'm just repeating myself, Ian. Uh, you you yes, were out, I, you're back. I, I, was, I was out. I, I, I have a response too. Um, which is that um, I can't speak for John, but I think he would agree that neither of us are, reli- are attacking religion or have an aversion to religion. I, I'm perf- I don't have any access to grind there. I'm perfectly happy for people to be religious. It gives a certain form and shape to all kinds of important issues. What I'm against is the way that a religious mindset and a particularly zealous form of a religious mindset is being used in a secularized way. And you could, you could draw a parallel perhaps between uh, the way communism um, uh, or even Stalinism or Maoism, um, you, could, you could say that it has its certain intellectual roots in the Enlightenment, in the, uh, I, the, the idea of ration, that it's completely rational, that it's a scientific theory and so on and so forth. And some people indeed, um, condemn the Enlightenment by uh, showing how in communism and even in fascism um, it uh, had very sinister consequences. But if you say that it has sinister consequences, you're not uh, condemning the Enlightenment itself. You're condemning the way that it's being, that a certain mindset, a certain set of ideas that was expressed in the Enlightenment is then misused uh, in a zealous way uh, in a different context. And I think what we're talking about is something similar. To point out the, uh, the, the, Protest- the, the, pro- the zealous Protestant element um, in woke is not to denounce Protestantism or even all the goals of woke. I mean, there are the, that, uh, um, there should be, that civil rights should be upheld, that women should be treated uh, as equals and so on, goes without saying just as communism had certain ideals that, that can be uh, uh, argued uh, that are, are positive. And um, one also should also say that Protestantism has had its positive uh, sides. I mean, the anti-slavery movement, if, uh, in, in, uh, the anti-slave trade movement in Europe also has Protestant roots. So it's not to condemn religion or to con- condemn Protestantism. It's to condemn a particular way that it's being used. Okay. Uh, you know, I'll accept. Go ahead, John. You know, another aspect of this may be, and I think both Ian and I share in common that we've both been mauled by this here and there. Whereas, Glenn, I don't know if you would s- say exactly the same thing. And so, you know. No, my mauling, my, my being mauled uh, goes all the way back to the 1980s when I emerged as a black conservative, quote unquote. So perhaps that's why I'm not as vociferous in my upset, uh, being upset about wokeness, because I've got the scars that predate <laughs> the rise of wokeness from my you know, heterodox uh, political identity. Uh, mm-hmm. That's something that you guys, I don't think, share with me. <laughs> well, I would definitely agree that I'm not attacking religion per se, Although anybody can smell that my attitude towards religion overall is not quite as specific as Ian's. That's true. But what I'm talking about is a certain aspect of religion. What I'm most moved by is the fact that many religions require that at a certain point you suspend logic. And I don't like seeing people put into the stakes with logic being suspended. I don't like watching people try to exonerate themselves using perfect sense and having people throw even more stones clearly enjoying it. And that is part of what the noble history of Christianity yeah. has been. You can't study European history without thinking. You know, you get roughly to about 400 AD 
And you say, well, that's a little early, but you get to about 800 AD and you start thinking, boy, if it only weren't for the church. And you think that over and over again, despite the marvelous things that are happening under its auspices as well. So, you know, it cuts, it cuts both ways. Yeah. And um, I'll just say this much about my forthcoming memoir. Late Admissions, Confessions of a Black Conservative. That's the title of my book. It'll be out in the spring of 2024. Uh, and I talk about my uh, s- struggle with the questions of faith, my credulity and my, my lack thereof, uh, and the requirement to embrace supernatural and, uh, you know, I don't believe in magic. That, that's kind of where I'm, I'm coming out. I mean, it, you know, I don't believe that you can hold your hand out and pray to God and someone's going to get healed of their cancer as a consequence of that, things of this kind. Okay, so uh, Marx has said, uh, this may be a paraphrase, religion is the opiate of the people. If wokeness can be thought of as a uh, religion, what would be the analog of that Marxian critique? That is to say, it, it diverts attention from the real questions of morality and politics and economics. This is Marx, religion, the opiate of the people, giving people a story so they don't have to think about their own exploitation. Is there something like that that is uh, brought to mind when one thinks about woke as a religion? That's, That's a question you, for you, Ian. Um, yes, I think you can make an argument that there is uh, uh, a parallel to that. Um, so t- to answer your question, I think there there is, I mean, without necessarily being a Marxist and, uh, and condemning all religion, I think religion has its place. And in uh, for many people, it answers questions of life and death and, uh, and and community and so on. And I think all those are necessary. And, and perhaps one of the reasons we're seeing these secular waves of moralism is because people don't go to church. And so I have to find a different way of, of um, uh, filling those desires. But um, I think wh- where Marx had a point is that when religion um, or pseudo-religion uh, becomes a substitute for um, serious political thought. And ser- by serious political thought, I mean thinking of ways to ameliorate uh, society uh, politically and economically, uh, and not just questions of faith and, and um, testimonies to moral righteousness. I think it, do- it is a distraction. Uh, I think woke is a distraction, and, and, uh, and it makes it too easy I wrote in my piece, for, for people who uh, belong to an elite uh, in the United States and elsewhere, who are often white, who are highly educated, uh, who are um, sometimes quite wealthy, it's much easier to, um, to, uh, to testify to your moral righteousness uh, and apologize for being privileged or white or whatever it, uh, else it is you need to apologize for, than it is to pay, let's say, higher tax for better public education or to think of ways to redistribute wealth more equitably and that kind of thing. And so in that sense, I'm entirely with Adolf Reed. Um, my politics are not necessarily his, but I, I agree with him that it is uh, a distraction from, from more important yeah, political issues. It, it- It's the human tendency to begin with a plan for action and for that to morph gradually into something subjective that's more about the self and comfort and gestures than action itself. And that's a problem because it means that you don't have what the old time civil rights leaders did. They wouldn't recognize what now passes as what's called anti Racism, And that's because anti-racism is nominally about changing society. But the idea that before you go out and do the dirty work, you have to have all of these mind games and torture sessions, et cetera, is, is fake. It's theatrical. It's artificial. And what it's really about is people gratifying themselves. I think that's a human tendency for the objective to go to the subjective and you have to check for it. That means that 
there need to be people standing on the sidelines pointing out that what's being presented as a political program is actually a kind of kabuki exercise. I think that's often almost inevitable. Okay, anyway. we're back with Ian uh, Baruma. We, we're having some connection <laughs> problems. Our, our editors are very good. They'll piece this together. It'll be fine. I have a question. Okay. I have a question. And, and my yeah. question is, yeah. where, where is the institutional left? I'm talking about labor unions. I'm talking about the Democratic Party. While the agenda of progressive politics has, to some degree, been hijacked by this quasi-religious, identitarian focused movement. How is it that we can understand the acquiescence in this development of people who work with their hands, have dirt under their fingernails, uh, are making $30 an hour, not $300 an hour, et cetera? Where's, where's as it were, the guts of the left, uh, as we've watched over the last quarter century, the rise of wokeness capturing uh, the imagination of of the activist element of of the uh, of the pro- progressive political you know quarter. Well, partly it probably is the result of the uh, weakening of unions and so on, and that's the result mm-hmm. of uh, different economic circumstances in that. Um, the old industrial working class is no longer uh, the proletariat on the whole that it was uh, in the 20th century. So I think the the, the demise of unions and uh, the, the the shift from an old industrial proletariat to something else uh, makes our time different from uh, the early 20th century, or even, even the latter half, began in the latter half of the 20th century, I think, that union politics, union, the, the industrial working class and so on played much less of a role in left-wing politics, their economic interests, that is, uh, than other things. And I think what took its place, um, not entirely, I mean, President Biden is an example of somebody who's still very much at the old sort of union left, but what be- began to take its place in the latter half of the 20th century was a shift uh, on the progressive side to issues such as the third world, uh, anti-racism, uh, sex and gender issues, and so on, none of which uh, uh, should be condemned or, or criticized. They're all important issues. But uh, I think that explains really why um, the left is no longer the left it once was. And um, with all the the positive, but also some of the negative consequences uh, we're, we're discussing. Yeah. Ian, um, I wanted to ask you about the New York Review of Books, where you were editor until September of 2018 and stepped down amidst some controversy after publishing John Gomeshi a piece of the Canadian uh, personality who was uh, accused of uh, sexual impropriety and wrote somewhat in his own defense under your editorship. And that created a firestorm. Uh, You want to describe your experience? And I'm asking in effect, because I think it somehow is implicated in your general critique of wokeness. uh, But I don't want to put words in your mouth to that effect. Yes. Well, of course, I wasn't accused of of sexual impropriety or anything uh, like that myself, which made it a rather unusual case. Um, the reason that I decided to publish that article was not because I wanted to defend him or defend what he may or may not have done. That was uh, a question of the law courts, and rightly or wrongly, uh, he was found not guilty. My interest really in it was uh, the nature of punishment by public opinion. What happens to people who, who is uh, alleged misdeeds um, uh, are not punished by law, in fact, are found not guilty. But then there's another punishment, which is a social punishment, the disgrace of losing your livelihood, et cetera, et cetera. And I was interested in, in, in that issue and wanted people to discuss it and have a debate about it. So I thought a personal account of uh, what it feels like to be um, subject to publish, to, to punishment by public opinion, would be interesting. It was not to, again, it was not to excuse or, or, or uh, 
defend what he'd done. And I think the, the issue there was, uh, my critics, was not the um, merit of his arguments or the literary value of the piece or anything like that. It was that it was felt that a person like that who was disgraced should not have a platform, uh, especially not in a sort of liberal left literary magazine, to um, give their account. And uh, of course, it should not have led to me being being kicked out of my chair. Um, but uh, it it was also an example of how uh, ideological shift in 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 the zeitgeist usually involve politics as well, and that's national politics, but also politics within uh, editorial rooms, museums, uh, and so on. And it becomes a way for people to get rid of somebody um, who is either, in their eyes, too old or too conservative or too white or whatever it may be, which is not to suggest that there was a sort of revolution in the office of people who all actively wanted to be ousted, but it was certainly an opportunity uh, to get rid of somebody like me that has again has a longer history with the New York Review in that I followed an old-fashioned um, editorial tyrant of the way my predecessor whom I adored and think was one of the great editors of the 20th century Robert Silvers but he was certainly very old-fashioned in that way and me following him of course made me uh, the receptacle of an awful lot of resentments that had been building up you know John John and I often talk about higher education on this podcast. Obviously, that's the universe we both inhabit. And why not? It's a topic that has moved front and center of late at both the state and national level. Free speech on campus, viewpoint diversity on campus, cancel culture on campus, soaring tuition, affirmative action, race-based admissions, accreditation, the erosion of standards, Attacks on the classics, hiring litmus tests, critical race theory, diversity, equity, and inclusion, you name it, it's in the news. So with all that's going on, and there's a lot going on, to whom can one turn as a trusted resource of all issues related to campus reform, whether you're a student, faculty, trustee, administrator, donor, policymaker, or alumni? One source we want you to know about and strongly recommend as a credible and respected voice on all these issues is the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, or ACTA, whom we're pleased to have supporting this episode. ACTA is on the front lines, promoting academic excellence, academic freedom, and accountability at America's colleges and universities. They don't just serve as trusted advisors to college trustees and alumni. They help arm reformers with resources, ideas, recommendations, information, even grassroots alumni support through their Campus Freedom Initiative. They make positive changes happen, and they approach these issues in a nonpartisan, balanced, informed, highly credible way, which we appreciate. If you care deeply about these issues, as John and I do, you really must know more about the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. Start by looking them up on the web at goacta.org. That's goacta.org. And follow them on Twitter and Facebook. Ian, did you feel that, and this is a genuine question, that the people who wanted you out were a minority of people? and that they had disproportionate influence upon others who ended up holding their nose and doing something they knew wasn't right, but figured that they had to because of the zeitgeist and the public square? <laughs> what well, a leading question, but did I you? Don't, I don't know how many people uh, I worked with, my, the editors in the office, actively wanted me out. I, I'm not sure many of them did, but... They the, didn't. But the, the arguments uh, that arose in the office about articles um, where I sometimes had to protect writers from overzealous editing of people who felt that they were, you know, straying from the progressive course, um, followed very much not gender divisions, but uh, generational. And those over 40, or certainly over 50, on the, ha 
were on the whole entirely on my side and um, you know shook their heads and rolled their eyes but in the end when it came to a crunch uh, preferred to examine their shoes rather than to speak up see that's the kind of thing that makes me so angry about these sorts of things when it isn't even real you know it's that kind of religion that yes. made me write woke racism in one bourbon fueled six weeks three summers ago because i just bourbon fueled. this is <laughs> it was bullet bourbon this is really an excrescence is what i thought this just isn't fair because most of the people in question doing these things don't even believe it themselves. Yeah, I just wondered if that is what no, I, had I, happened. No, I entirely agree. And, and and what is most what was most shocking to me, um, and this is this goes beyond um, the New York Review itself. It, it's not so much the zealotry. We know that there's zealotry. We know that there are zealots. We know why some people, whatever psychological for whatever psychological reasons become zealots, what is much more shocking is the, the, is the, the cowardice of people who should know, who know better and should s stand up for it. And uh, there's an awful lot of that kind of cowardice around. And you see this in, in so many different countries and so many different periods of history and so on. I mean, this is not, not a tool you need to our time. But people are, are, are fearful. And the, the, the number of people, let's say, in, in the early 30s in, in Germany, that rarely uh, stuck their necks out, of course, very small, um, even though many people would not have agreed uh, with anything that the Nazis would do. And, and that was a most much more dangerous situation than, than we're having today. Most people don't want to fight, and I completely understand that. Most people figure that their priority is their dear ones and their livelihood. That is completely natural. But that's just the thing. It's one thing to not want to stick your head out in Germany in 1934. It's another thing to not want to stick your neck out when it's about whether or not Ian Baruma should edit a very prestigious journal or any number of other things, where it seems to me that the stakes are lower and it's really just a matter of will you be popular often. For some people, it's, they're not afraid they're going to lose their job. It's just, are they going to be able to stand tall near the water cooler? Well, and I consider that petty. Well, it goes further than that. I mean, uh, then once that happens to you, um, People become afraid of contagion, so uh, they, they'll shy away from not socially at all in my case, but they'll, professionally, they'll shy away from you because they don't want to be associated with it. Just because it could possibly then taint them, and I mean mm -hmm. there is perhaps a certain uh, an American aspect to this that, it, and uh, my uncle was a film director and made films in Hollywood as well as although he was British. And he always used to say that um, when you have a success in America, you're king. Everybody just will, will want to serve you in any way they, they can. Once you have a failure, suddenly the telephone stops ringing. Suddenly doors close. Suddenly people won't take meetings anymore and so on. In a very, 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 very mild way, I certainly experienced something like that. You know, there is a certain logic to this behavior that you're describing in that if a boycott is, is going to work, a, a, a social constraint requiring conformity to some norm or some uh, pattern of behavior, if it's going to work, you can't just sanction violators. You have to also sanction the people who don't sanction the violators. You have to close the circle. It's a bit like not crossing the picket line. I'm not on strike myself, but I'm not going to cross the picket line because I don't want to seem to be a foul of the general norm of labor power and whatever. So I'm not surprised that this uh, very effective uh, uh, environment of conformity finds within it the, the, the phenomenon that you're describing of, of what you're calling cowardice, but in a way maybe is also just the affirmation of the sense of righteousness, of trying to signal I'm on the right side of history, of, of trying to communicate that, yes, I too affirm uh, the value here, anti-racism, uh, anti-misogyny, or whatever it might be. Well, it's comfortable to conform, but, but one of the things that um, some people objected to, um, some of the younger editors, in my case, was something that I find very important. 
and that it's in order to make people think, which I think is the primary duty of a writer or, or an editor, it's to make people think, especially people who, who, whose, whose politics and views are not so fairly similar to one's own. You have to examine your own assumption or the, or the assumptions of people who are with you on your side. You have to, as Isaiah Berlin, the philosopher once said, I mean, the best way to, to protect enlightenment values um, is to constantly subject it to criticism. And so I, I, as an editor, I enjoyed running pieces that went a little against the grain. And I think one of the unfortunate consequences of, uh, of the sort of, the, let's call it the, 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 wet, the woke wet wave, is that people have become very, very afraid of doing that. And of course, that has to do with the polarization of the United States and many other democracies today as well. You don't want to give ammunition to the other side. So what you do in the end is you don't criticize your own side anymore. You just affirm the right, rightness of your side. And that leads to a great deal of conformity, and, and it will end up being a very boring uh, culture. So I, I fear in the next, you know, I, However long it takes, I mean, everything changes. But I fear that, that we're, we're in a period of very timid, informist uh, culture in the arts as well as intellectual life. But let and me ask you know, this. Uh, excuse me, John. I just want to ask Ian, uh, who is uh, a student of culture and politics in the East, in China and Japan, uh, who is of European origin and very well informed about what's going on in, in Europe, whether there's something unique about uh, the American instantiation of this phenomenon that we're describing, or even about the Anglo sphere, about uh, the UK, Canada, Australia, the US being perhaps different from Germany or different from France uh, along, these, uh, uh, along these lines. Well, it's a very good Ian. question. I'd uh, I do think it's stronger in the English-speaking world than it is outside, but where it is strong outside tends to be in Northern Europe, uh, again, with strong Protestant traditions. It's much less pronounced, even in France, certainly Spain, Italy, uh, and so on. But uh, I, I, I hesitate to use the word unique for anything because so, so, so little human is unique. Um, a particular fervor may be... Um, more common in the United States than elsewhere. But what it shows is how strong American soft power still is. Mm. Um, and uh, people talk about the, you know, the decline of American power and how nobody really cares anymore, or not, not as much as they used to, but what people say right in America, it, it matters a great deal. And I think with, and now I'm, I'm on very thin ice because I'm speaking on a subject that I don't know enough about, but, what an interesting example might be uh, what's happening in the intellectual life in certain African countries, where the, the experience that this we do know, the experience of, of, of African Africans is not the same as the experience of African Americans. And yet, I, I am told uh, at universities in Africa, more and more, the jargon, the American jargon, that reflects the experience of African Americans, rightly or wrongly, it is being used now by uh, African intellectual students, and professors, and so on, who live in a completely different uh, environment and situations. And, and I only bring this up that it's an it's an interesting reflection on how strong American soft power still is, how influential uh, uh, America is in these. In these I've also, uh, yeah, I've also heard that um, in England, people are taking on the Black Lives Matter rhetoric about the police, despite the fact that, you know, England is not a perfect place, but the cops issue there is quite different from what it is here. It's rather just the charisma of the rhetoric. And that well, soft yeah, power that you're talking just, about... Just can, to, to say one thing, not perhaps quite as different as you might think. I mean, the cops can be pretty brutal in written too, but I take your point. And, and somebody has just written a book about, and I can't remember the title, but it's something like, you know, this is not America, where somebody, a British writer with an African background. 
I'm glad you mentioned that because I, of course, and I'm sitting here in New York City, I'm getting this from talking to one British person who was saying that, you know, the situation is completely different. You would certainly know better than me, and I definitely want to look at that book. But they were just surprised at the nature of the rhetoric. But then also, um, you're definitely right about the Protestant aspect. Germany, um, mainland Scandinavia, not France as much. I hear it's starting, but it's interesting that it took so long. Haven't heard of any, uh, only a little from Spain, but a lot from Brazil. And I think that has to be because of the particular racial situation in Brazil, despite the fact that I wouldn't necessarily associate Brazil with Protestantism. But there are many ways that this can jump the fence that would make something like this jump the fence. And yeah, it's this is one of the worst exports from America since... Um, well, most of the things that we export, this is one of the worst things. Okay, it's unfortunate. <laughs> All right, I've got a final question for you guys, both of you, actually, which is every action, an equal and opposite reaction. Well, that's a physical principle, not a political principle, but you can expect there are reactive consequences to the rise of wokeness. And uh, I don't know whether Brexit is one of them, I don't know whether Donald Trump is one of them, but I suspect that the uh, impact of both of those movements in the UK and the US respectively has been abetted by some reaction to wokeism. And I wonder whether or not you share that view um, and if it connects at all to the religious character of the, of the movement for woke. Well, who's gonna go first? I'm going to go first, Ian, because I have less yeah. less to say. This is the stupidest thing I have ever said on this show, because I'm probably wrong. But I know that I'm supposed to think that Trump's election was partly because of a certain kind of person. And Glenn, we've talked about this person. For me, it's the woman who runs the liquor store in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Supposedly, she doesn't like the fact that people in my world look down on her. And it's part of why she votes for Trump. I have read people in my world saying that that's an issue. It never strikes me as something of great concern to those people when I encounter them in various ways. I wonder if they care about us as much as we think they care about us. I think that it's, it's different. I'll bet you could throw a bunch of polling data at me that show that that woman who's running the liquor store is deeply insulted that people with college degrees look down on her. I would be open to seeing it. But there's a part of me that thinks that that's a story that we like to tell each other. So I don't know. And it's partly because I haven't done a true study. Ian? Well, I, I think it's linked to Trump and Brexit in the sense that, and, and this you know, needs to be repeated over and over, that but on the whole, even though woke may have started amongst uh, African-Americans, but on the whole, it's very much associated with a cultural and educational elite. The same yes. that, that is pro-European uh, Union, that was uh, in favor of global liberalization, global economics, uh, and so on and so forth. Urban, largely. And um, uh, it's a sort of deep resentment and anger against that elite, rightly or wrongly, but which uh, mostly wrongly, but partly rightly, that led to Brexit and led to the election of Donald Trump. And so, uh, in, in in that sense, uh, I think there is a link. But what is in, what seems to be interesting, and there's a piece in today's New York Times about this, is that apparently the the, the DeSantis sort of anti woke crusade is not turning on uh, Republican voters particularly, mm -hmm. and which mm -hmm. means that many people who who vote Republican still, despite Trump. Um, do not do so out of the loathing for the elites, because after all, a strong chunk of the Republican Party itself is still elite. But but woke mm -hmm. Brexit and Trump certainly are linked in that shared uh, loathing of, of the elites. Mm -hmm. So John's colleague uh, at the New York Times, David Brooks, had a column that I'm sure you've both seen recently in which he asked, the question, are we the bad guys? I can't remember exactly how he put it, but that was, the that was the substance of it. He asked of his colleagues on the left, are we, are we the bad guys? I know David Brooks is a Republican, but he's a, he's a you know, never Trump Republican. And, you know, he's a good Republican. 
Yeah. And he's self-consciously uh, a member of the establishment elite, the coastal uh, cadres here in the U.S. And um, I'm wondering what you think of that, Ian, of, of Brooks's argument. Well, I, 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 must, I think I probably missed it. But um, ah. if the argument is that, you know, that, uh, that the elites have screwed up, um, That's the argument. The argument yeah. is a lot of people out there don't know where their next meal is coming from. Right. A lot of people out there are not so happy well, with, um, it, I don't know what, gender affirming care. Right. Uh, they, they, you know, they, they don't know that the United States is an unrelenting, you know, uh, instance of uh, moral turpitude that, you know, et cetera. They're proud of their country. And the elites have just looked over their heads, have talked them down, have said they cling to their guns and their religion, have right. dismissed them. Well, that's, that's the problem. There base. is a, there is a yeah, the, that the elite look down on them. It's another well, there is one a of David's truth. David's David's truth. But but I think that that's aesthetic. I think a much more much more consequential thing, and you can't morally condemn the elite or the progressive elite for this. But is that and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about the demise of, of the unions and and sort of socialist politics or social democratic politics, which is that. Certainly, since the late eighties and nineties, um, the, the the liberal left on economics and, and global economics and globalization and immigration and so on, pretty mu much the same as the as the centre right, and that distinction has disappeared. And in in Europe, uh, in very concrete ways, in that uh, many governments, government coalitions, consist of sort of old-fashioned 19th century liberals in the European sense, meaning conservatives, and uh, the liberal left. And, that, and I would include in that somebody like Tony, Tony Blair. I mean, he was not in a coalition government like that, but he was very instrumental in this. Bill Clinton, too. And once the elites who themselves were benefiting materially and otherwise from global economics and neoliberalism in various ways, uh, then it became a real problem for the left because they were losing the, the, the working, working class vote more and more. And the more they were losing them and the more the resentment on the working, working class voters rose, the more uh, people in the elites were inclined to say, oh, well, you're just a bunch of racists and gun lovers and so on. Often true, but certainly not always and, so, and, and extremely unwise uh, to express. Okay. Well, I don't know. You guys got anything to add? Uh, I know your time is short here, Ian. Well, I hope you can stitch it all together. Makes it, makes it look, so, look okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll be fine. And thank you so much yeah, it was uh, for giving us some of your time. All right. Bye-bye. So long. Okay. So John and I will continue for a bit and before we conclude the entire program. But I wanted to ask uh, you, John, about uh, your recent piece on the controversy over the African-American history curriculum in Florida, uh, which now uh, famously uh, included a clause that called attention to the fact that some enslaved people acquired skills, even in slavery, that they were able to exploit to some degree for their own benefit. And this is elicited a vitriolic denunciation from many quarters, including the vice president of the United States, who, in speaking to a, a sorority of African American uh, sorority, uh, denounced uh, Ron DeSantis and company for trying to minimize the horrors of slavery. And uh, others have weighed into the same effect. And you had a, a piece on that. And I, I wondered if you'd share uh, some of your thoughts about about that controversy. Well, what that what that came down to was that there was this curriculum put together by a work group that included black people and Latino people. And there were 191 points made. I mean, frankly, I don't think anybody is expected to teach all 191 things, but there were 191 points made. Exactly one of them was one sentence saying that slaves sometimes learn skills during their enslavement, which helped them. Just one thing out of 191. Now, Kamala Harris, I, I don't 
want to join the dog pile on her. She's a very busy person. I'm sure that some aide told her that the curriculum said that and that neither she nor the aide probably bothered to take a look at the document. I cannot believe that Kamala Harris really knew that it was one sentence and then got up and made it sound like that point was like one of three or something like that. And I think a lot of people really were not bothering to look at the whole document. But, you know, even if you just have a sense that there were, say, 12 things, and that was one of them, why dogpile on that one sentence as a characterization of the whole document as being in some kind of denial about slavery, as if we're at a point in 2023 where a critical mass of people genuinely want you to think that the slaves were happy? Why fight yesterday's battles? Why pretend that it's 1939 when progress does happen? And more to the point, it seems like it was about 10 minutes ago that a certain kind of race man was trying to show that slaves actually managed to thrive often in creative ways despite slavery. So there was a grand old argument about the resilience of families despite being split apart, that it was an adaptation to slavery, that Black family structures often involve people who were not necessarily biological kin, that black people could get along without being married because they so often supposedly had to during slavery, which in fact is not especially true, but that's what a lot of people thought in the 1960s and 70s. So the idea was to show that we made the best of the very, very worst. And that sort of thing would have included saying that many slaves learned skills. There were house slaves, there were field slaves, there were artisanal slaves. Many slaves did things other then pick plants. And after slavery was over, you could benefit from those things. And all of a sudden, you're not supposed to say this. If you had to choose between being somebody out picking the cotton and being the person who makes everybody's shoes and shoes the horses, you'd probably choose the second thing. That doesn't mean that your life was anything like perfect or even fair, but I would call that a benefit if you were doing that. But no, you're not supposed to say that now. It's the perfect example of where we are in our times, that we have to actually dehumanify slaves. We have to pretend that all it was was grinding oppression by evil white people and that there's no room for resilience or coping or anything like it. And we must convey that message. That's the message that we have to convey because, and you know what? Because what? It's like we're doing it for somebody. It's like we think somebody's watching. It's like there's some sort of God. We have to strike this pose and pretend that a slave couldn't do anything that might make life a little bit better for them. All of this is kabuki. It's play acting. And I'm not accusing only Kamala Harris. It's everybody who criticized one line. And wouldn't you know, that one line was created by one of the black members of the panel. He's a card-carrying Republican black conservative, and he wanted to show that even under slavery, black people managed to cope as best as they could. That makes him a bad man? I say no. So that's why I wrote you're, you're referring to William Allen, yeah, uh, who was one member of the commission that came up with this curriculum guideline. Mm -hmm. uh, who, as it happens, is the father of Danielle Allen. His yeah, daughter is a that. very distinguished uh, philosopher and political theorist at Harvard. Mm -hmm. uh, a woman of the moderate left, I, I should add. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I'm not going to be as kind to Vice President Kamala Harris. I thought it was sheer demagoguery. I, I thought you say you don't believe that she knew. I quite, I beg to differ. I, I believe that she knew full well exactly what she was doing. There's a line showing that DeSantis wants black kids to be taught in Florida that slavery made black people better off. The line did no such thing. It observed that, as you have just noted, some enslaved people acquired skills, and it went on to observe that those skills could redound to the benefit, personal benefit of those enslaved persons. That's true. That just happens to be true as a matter of historical fact. The question of how much emphasis you put on that is fair. It's a fair question. Is that the only thing you're going to say about slavery? No, of course not. But the curriculum doesn't put it as the only thing you would. It's one amongst scores upon scores of observations uh, that could be made. So I think and the scores are the normal things. And the whole document reads like something that, you know, Du Bois 
or Kwesi Mfume or anybody would have written. As you put it, the document is so effective in communicating the horrors of slavery that you're surprised Ron DeSantis would endorse it. That's John McWhorter, not me. I think that's a cheap (laughs) shot, but never mind. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) (laughs) Never mind. Uh, I mean, it's like this history has to be a weapon and can't just be an exploration of the objective record. It's, it's like you can't realize or recognize or, or observe that the interests of the owners of enslaved persons were complicated. Their, their interests included the preservation of the productivity of the people who they depended upon uh, to provide labor. So, for example, the diet of the enslaved persons would, to some degree, be influenced by the calculation that the slave owner would make about the future value of his, her asset uh, as a function of how much people, how many calories people got to eat, uh, et cetera. That they, to, to say that slavery was unrelenting a horror of physical abuse uh, uh, overlooks the observation that unrelenting physical abuse of the livestock of the uh, uh, of the planter would also be not in his interest. So, you know. And yet, if we say this, we are sanctioning slavery. It's this either or kind of thought that we're but we're not to indulge, and we're not, and everybody knows it. But you know, to even say this, we have to make sure everybody knows that slavery was an evil thing. Why are we fighting that battle? And you know what, Glenn? If there are a few people hiding under a few rocks who really do still think that slaves were singing happily out in the fields, well, you know, the world will keep spinning. Don't we have more important things to think about than that? All of this play acting is really, it really, it makes no sense. And it perplexes me, I don't know, Kamala Harris, to see somebody in that position indulging in that kind of nonsense. I just... People can do, people should do better. People should just do better. I I just want people who hear this to know that uh, yesterday, that's uh, August uh, 4th. uh, I'm sorry. Yesterday was August 6th. (laughs) At the Glenn Show, uh, the Substack, GlennLaurie.substack, I published an essay by Robert Cherry. This is the economist who's been an occasional guest on the Glenn Show, and he's a friend of mine. He's an economist emeritus at Brooklyn College, City University of New York, in which he just reviews uh, casually the historical record. Um, You made allusion to the fact that enslaved families were not completely destroyed by the institution of slavery. And he observes the work of Herbert Gutman to that effect, uh, chronicling the condition of the Black family in slavery and freedom. He observes that uh, the economist Robert Fogel in his book, Time on the Cross, documented the extent to which the interest of slave owners uh, tempered their abuse in their own self-interest on behalf of the larger goal of making a profit on their plantations. Um, He calls attention to the work of Eugene Genovese. Uh, The book is called Roll, Jordan Roll, uh, in which Genovese observes that there were informal constraints on the abusive uh, behavior of planters because, for example, uh, you send your son over to the slave quarters to uh, carouse around with the women, uh, and the women have men in the slave quarters who may react very negatively to their uh, being imposed upon in this way, an anticipation which mitigated the extent to which, of course, there was a lot of rape under slavery. (laughs) I don't want to be misunderstood, but it wasn't wholesale and unrestrained for reasons of that kind, according to some historians. Anyway, Cherry's essay reviews this uh, ground, and I think it's a useful uh, contribution to the debate. Definitely. Okay. I think that's enough for Glenn and John. Uh, I should mention that the conversations we have in an ongoing way here at the Glenn Show, John McWhorter and I, are Uh, Also supported uh, by uh, support from ACTA, the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. 
uh, who I am proud to say helped to sponsor the Glenn Show. So with that, uh, we'll call it a day, John. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Glenn. 